In more than 300 communities across Ontario, public libraries open their doors to readers, and increasingly, others looking for a much wider range of services. Our Ontario Hubs journalists have been looking into that, and we've got them all together to tell us more. Here are now from our studio at Confederation College in Thunder Bay, John Thompson, our Northwestern Ontario Hub journalist, from Laurentian University in Sudbury covering the Northeast, Nick Dunn, from Ottawa via Skype, Shelby Lisk, who heads up our Ontario Hub that covers Indigenous issues, from our studio in Kingston, Ontario, David Rockney Corrigan covering Eastern Ontario. And finally, from our studio at Western University in London, Ontario, Mary Baxter in our Southwest Ontario hub. Welcome everyone. It's nice to have everyone on the show all at once. We rarely get this, so it's nice to have everyone here. So we've all talked about libraries this week. Uh, I'm gonna start with you, Shelby. Uh, you talked about libraries in First Nations communities, and you talked about the struggle in funding. Why is it? Why is funding so difficult for First Nations communities, for libraries specifically? Yeah, so in First Nations communities, they don't have access to municipal tax dollars, which is what our public libraries in Ontario, 95% of their budget comes from municipal tax dollars. So First Nations libraries have to rely solely on grants from the provincial government or funding from the federal government for on-reserve education, which we know is already funded less than off-reserve education. But once they have the library up and running, they can register and then they can work with organizations like the Ontario Library Association and Ontario Library Service north to access more streams of funding for their collection and to pay a librarian. And I'm curious, in terms of the amount of libraries that First Nations community have, there's a pretty stark contrast in terms of how many there are and how many uh, First Nations communities there are? Yes. In Ontario, there are 133 First Nations and only 46 of them currently have libraries. Now, in your article, you did write about uh, the program, The School Box, uh, an organization that helps uh, remedy uh, this situation. And you looked at specifically two First Nations communities. Tell us about that program and what they were able to accomplish. Yeah, so the School Box program actually started by building schools and libraries in Nicaragua. But then in 2017, Terry Mikas, who's a counselor in Wabaskang First Nation, was on the trip and she said, you know, I really wish that we had this program back in my community. And the director of the program, she just had no idea that this was the state um, in Canada with First Nations libraries. So she decided to bring the program home. And so they now call it the School Box North program. And so in Wabaskang First Nation, they were able to establish a library in 2017. And then this year, um, in the Szechuan First Nation, they took an unused uh, bay of a, their fire hall and they transformed it into a library. And they were able to access funding to get them over a thousand books now that are and mostly First Nations authors and First Nations content, which is really awesome for them. Very impressive. Now we want to move to Eastern Ontario with David Rockney Corgan. People experiencing homelessness often take refuge in libraries. Is that a problem? If so, why? Uh, well, it, some cities, uh, some libraries uh, have, have deem deemed it a problem, Jay Ann. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking uh, particularly at Ottawa, the Ottawa Public Library's main branch on, on Metcalf Street. For many years, uh, the front lobby uh, has been open several hours earlier than the rest of the library. It was sort of a, a nice gesture, a, a courtesy to some people experiencing homelessness in that city, uh, a place for warmth uh, after the, the shelters, uh, after people leave shelters in the morning for a couple of hours, they, you could sit on these benches. Uh, and, and that went on for, for many, many years. Um, fast forward to last November, uh, the Ottawa Public Library is now a tenant uh, in this building that they've been using for the public library. Without going too much into that, they're in the process of moving their uh, main branch. So they're currently tenants, and uh, there were some instances of drug use uh, and, and fighting in the lobby. So the, what the library did was close those doors and, and, and leave them closed until uh, 10 o'clock, 9.30 in the morning, when the security guards came there. So it became one less place for, for homeless folks in, in that city to go. So uh, one counselor, Catherine McKenney, uh, has been uh, fighting back on, on that. Uh, they say that it's, it's unfair uh, and that it discriminates unfairly against uh, homeless folks in the city. Um, obviously, you know, besides the counselor, the, libra the libraries themselves knew this was an issue. I'm curious, what are some Eastern Ontario libraries doing to help with that? 
Sure. So, you know, different libraries uh, across the country really have been dealing with this for for years. It's it's nothing new that uh, people experiencing homeless are are using our libraries, uh, and and sometimes I issues flare up. I know just a, last week actually in in Windsor, Ontario, uh, the the Windsor Public Library made some changes to their code of conduct, and you know was allowing uh, in in one case changing the rules so only three bags uh, maximum were allowed in the library, and some folks there were saying that that discriminates against against homeless people. Uh, one thing that I have been seeing, and uh, this is coming up across North America, is, is the lessons learned from a book called The Librarian's Guide to Homelessness. And this came from a guy who's actually not a librarian, but uh, the executive director of a, of a big homeless shelter outside of Chicago. Uh, and this has lessons for library workers uh, to take on and, and address some of the challenges that are presented uh, by, by dealing with some of our city's most vulnerable folks. So one example is, you know, how to deal with somebody who's, who's Who's sleeping. I think that one thing uh, we all can take for granted is is how tiring it can be uh, to be living on the street. You know, you you're often not with much food. You're you're sleeping in a situation maybe where there are dozens of people around you. You're often on foot, and, and it can be very tiring. So I think uh, this book is 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 showing, and the lessons from that are showing how we can uh, show a little bit more compassion uh, for some of our city's most vulnerable, especially in what has become a front line uh, in in, our, in these cities' uh, handling of of homelessness, which is our libraries. Definitely. Now we're going to move over to Mary Baxter. Uh, you know, we've talked about Wi-Fi and access to, to Internet across Ontario, but you wrote about it in the library in terms of how can libraries facilitate high, high Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, which is what some libraries are doing in your region. Tell me about that program. How can they facilitate that? Well, Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, first off, they're uh, what they are are uh, actual devices that you can you can plug in. Um, they they can accommodate up to I think around ten devices that can use it to gain uh, access to to the internet. And one of the reasons why that's important, particularly in in this region in, in rural remote regions, is that not everybody has internet at home. They you know they still can't in those areas. They still can't access it because the infrastructure isn't there. In places like London, uh, the, the challenge is, is really more about uh, equity of access where people simply can't afford it. Uh, uh, and so they might be working full time. It's hard to get to places like the library to use uh, the Wi-Fi systems there. So these types of programs really help to uh, uh, provide a, um, a bridge for, for people who need access to the internet. Now, in your piece, you had talked about how funding for this program has changed in some jurisdictions. Uh, how are there any solutions in, in terms of getting funding for these programs, which obviously seem like there's a big need for? It's it's a real challenge because um, uh, there's there's a question: Should governments be funding this? I uh, should should. Uh, uh, the uh, money for these types of programs come from fundraising. In uh, London, in uh, recent uh, budget discussions, City Council decided that I, to not fund uh, the program at the library uh, because, uh, because of the opportunity to perhaps get funding from fundraising or from sponsorship. I, but that really raises a question because we are talking about an equity issue. But libraries' budgets, they're strapped. You know, I talked to one small uh, library and they said they only have like $5,000 for all of the technology that they run for a year. And Wi-Fi hotspots maintaining them took over $1,000. I'm going to move over to John. Uh, we're going to move from funding to the topic of safety. Now, that was uh, the top issue for uh, visitors at Thunder Bay's library. Tell us about uh, the, what the library board discovered there. Well, some people found it to be safety, Jan. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the threads I've heard running through all of these stories so far is that when we talk about issues of, of public space, we're talking about spaces where everyone is welcome. And that includes homelessness and uh, it includes people who are desperately poor and the working class. Um, and in Thunder Bay, more often than not, it includes uh, disproportionately Indigenous people. Um, so when the, the Thunder Bay Library was doing its strategic plan consultation, 
conversations with the community. They asked two questions. They asked, uh, what is your hope for the community and what are your concerns for the community? Didn't ask anything about libraries at all. And then, and so it did find among, uh, among settler people uh, that there were safety concerns uh, for those populations they were seeing there. Uh, indigenous people, as Chief Librarian John Pateman says, called it for what it was, racism. The library has had 75 staff and not one of them as of 2016 was of indigenous descent. So but they started making changes. As I'm aware, that has changed a little bit. Tell us about the measures the board has taken to make libraries more inclusive. You'll remember that at the time Thunder Bay was undergoing, uh, its police service and board were undergoing simultaneous mm -hmm. investigations uh, for systemic racism. And the Thunder Bay Library has really emerged as a champion of anti-racism work. And so what that looks like practically uh, is, is very diverse from, having, from taking indigenous uh, literature out of the Dewey Decimal System, which some people understand to be inaccessible, uh, to, to uh, putting it all together and increasing its profile to having uh, increased organizations using the library and uh, and and programming specifically by and for indigenous people. Uh, but it's also some of the things that David was talking about, where you have street nurses and uh, and social workers who have access to that space. And it's also training and employment. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had uh, Northern Minister Rickford in the office uh, of the library dropping $750,000 on training and employment services for people who may have those skills, but don't necessarily uh, have the, the certificates to move into uh, full-time employment. Thanks for that, John. I'm curious, Nick, I never thought I would ask this question. What do snowshoes have to do with libraries? Well, Jan, I never thought I'd have to answer this question either, <laughs> so that makes two of us here. Um, the snowshoes at the library in Sudbury, that's part of a larger object lending program they have. So you can loan uh, snowshoes. That started in 2016. In 2014, as part of a larger uh, program, you could uh, lend out um, fishing equipment, with, complete with a tackle box, fishing rod, etc. Um, this was done, I suppose, in response to declining engagement at the library. And what we're seeing here is the library really trying to adapt to changing demands and um, giving opportunities for learning in all its forms, not just in books, but in experiential learning, you know, going outside, learning the local geography. What's been the ripple effect of making sports equipment and, uh, you know, fishing rods available to borrow? Hmm. Well, you know, uh, we've seen a fair amount of engagement with it. I think since 2016, they've lended out uh, something around 1,500 snowshoes and wow. about 145 to 150 fishing rods. I don't know if it's made a, you know, huge difference in uh, the library's overall membership numbers, but I think, you know, uh, you know this uh, particular piece about the uh, snowshoes in the library and the work of all the hubs reporters are showing that libraries are always adapting to the needs of a community uh, and that, you know, they're not just stuck in an archaic time of, uh, you know, silence and books and uh, research, you know. Uh, the Toronto Public Library, for example, is lending out podcasts equipment and uh, you know maker spaces where people can learn basic coding who can make uh, you know t-shirt print presses and whatnot um, you know these are all things that are been popping up in libraries around the country for the past maybe five ten years or so Nick I want to thank you so much and I want to thank all the rest of the hubsters Mary Baxter David Rockney Corrigan Shelby Lisk and John Thompson some very interesting stories from across the region about libraries again we can you guys can watch and read the articles on our website at tbo.org. Thanks again, guys. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.